For the last 50 years, an environmental organization has dedicated itself to supporting the commitment and creativity of those determined to meet the challenges posed by climate change and reduce pollution and overexploitation of the natural environment. This is the story of the World Wildlife Fund in Belize. All around us exist ecosystems, fragile but highly productive communities of living things. But both natural and man-made forces pose serious threats to the delicate balance of ecosystems. However, by introducing simple and often cost-effective techniques, these threats can be minimized. In Belize, the WWF is on a mission to share such techniques and support anyone adopting these measures. The World Wildlife Fund has been one of our strongest supporter and the idea of developing a coastal zone management plan sits very well with their own particular strategy in terms of global environmental uh, sustainability and to that extent they have partnered with us in helping to develop our plan. A considerable portion of Belize's economy is directly dependent on the resources of the sea. But all those dollars earned through tourism and commercial fishing pale in comparison to the real value of the reef. The structure itself breaks the waves, providing an important defense against storm surge and coastal erosion. The living reef supports recreation and provides habitat for commercial fish stock. While Belize's reef systems are in relatively good condition, several areas have been ravaged by bleaching events, disease, and hurricanes. But among the dead and the damaged, scientists found life. I've been here for 15 years and I was observing many of these corals starting to come back since Iris. And um, since they were coming back and seeming to thrive in small pockets, it seemed like these corals were more resilient or resistant to all the impacts that had affected them. Marine biologist Lisa Karn collected what she calls fragments of opportunity from battered staghorn and elkhorn colonies, favorite habitats of the commercially important Caribbean spiny lobster. I actually first had this idea right after Hurricane Iris in 2001 when um, the reefs were so destroyed here that I went to San Pedro to work. And there I noticed some of these broken elkhorn coral laying on the sand in the seagrass beds but still living. So of course I thought I was a genius and thought that I was the first one to come up with a sort of reforesting um, the reefs. But when I did a literature search, um, Austin Bowden Kirby was one of the first people to have published on this type of work. And that was in 2002. It took me four years to secure funding because there were so many people that A, didn't understand the need for it and B, didn't think that it would really work. And so it wasn't really until 2006 when these corals were put on the red list for endangered species that people started paying attention. And I got my first funding, a small research grant from PACT, which is Protected Areas Conservation Trust in Belize. Um, and that was a year-long project. And I brought, at the time, I didn't know the term for it, but I brought fragments of opportunities of the elkhorn coral from the outer reef into Laughing Bird Key National Park. And with support from the World Bank, the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, and WWF, has established and maintained 11 coral nursery sites, of which six are in southern Belize. To date, we've planted over 1,700 corals, which sounds like a lot, but in the scheme of things, um, it's really not. And uh, hopefully, in the next 18 months or so, we'll be able to really um, scale up the nursery efforts, because this was a trial project but really to provide those ecosystem services and really say that we're restoring a reef, we'd have to do a lot more. Where we choose to outplant the corals ideally should be in a no-take zone or a um, completely protected area. We do have many marine protected areas in Belize, but they don't actually have the full protection that we need. There's only less than 4% of Belize's waters are in a completely protected no-take zone. Very, very little of it. And Laughing Bird Key is one of the large amounts of it, one of the longer established ones um, that's, that's proving success. Larger fish here, larger lobster, more conch, conch like sand, more conch probably than anywhere in the Caribbean at this moment. So um, this is the outplant site that, that we've chosen to really focus these efforts on. These waters here, directly east of Placencia and out to Gladden Spit, these inner keys, have been hotter 
longer, more hot and for longer periods than anywhere else in Belize. And so the whole concept behind this project is that these corals here are somewhat thermally adapted already. They're already somewhat used to, to the warmer seawater temperatures. Um, they've already survived all these multiple stresses, all these hurricanes, bleaching events. And so the concept is that these corals are somewhat hardier and stronger than their predecessors. And then we know that um, there will only be more hurricanes and more bleaching events. So we're hoping that we can propagate more of the stronger genotypes of corals and really just encourage the natural repopulation of these corals. So the, the idea, the goal is, one, to save the species from extinction so they don't die out completely, and two, um, to begin to restore some of the ecosystem services that we want from a natural, healthy reef. Climate change is expected to continue to affect the coral reef. But World Wildlife Fund joined the Nature Conservancy and others to launch an early warning alert system for coral bleaching. In 2008, there was a bleaching event that started occurring in the Mesoamerican Reef and WWF, um, along with a couple other international um, conservation organizations, got together and they formed the Mesoamerican Reef Coral Watch program. We have different stakeholders involved in monitoring the corals for coral bleaching. We have the marine guides that are out there on the field every day because that's what they do for a living. And so when they notice changes, then they send the reports to us. And then when we receive reports from them indicating that there might be severe bleaching approaching, then members of the coral network uh, schedule a certain date and they go out and they conduct scientific monitoring of the reefs. Um, in February 2010, the World Bank sponsored um, a three-day hands-on workshop in, in Placencia here where we involved local tour guides. Um, we brought in fisheries um, personnel and the local NGO, the people that um, manage Laughing Bird Key National Park. Um, <clears throat> we had about 50, and we also had international participants, regional, we had from Mexico and we had from Dominican Republic. And so we were able to showcase the nurseries, do a hands-on um, experience with uh, making some of the ropes, making some of the, the trays, and also in several of the outplanting uh, methodologies. So that was an excellent opportunity to really show people how they can proactively help um, get involved with um, beginning to restore some of the reef. Um, and the tour guides are really my best eyes and ears. They're the ones that are in the water every day, all the time. And they let me know when corals start bleaching. They let me know if there's um, any problems in the nurseries. They let me know when things are doing well. So it's been great to have that support. And I'm hoping that as people realize the significance of this work, on a larger scale, this needs to scale up, and I think it really could employ more people as well. It could be a secondary income. It is a regular, I mean, you can't just set something up and leave it. You need regular monitoring of both the nurseries and the outplants. And as I mentioned before, when you start growing these corals, they grow so fast that within seven to ten months, you really need to be constantly trimming them and constantly outplanting. And so we have to look at this as a long-term effort. I'm saying, you know, five to ten years, you know, a reef was not built overnight. And again, we're just trying to accelerate the natural recovery process, but we are seeing success. And we'd like to use Laughing Bird Key as a model for how uh, restoration could really work. And we know we need to really scale up the effort to, to sway over the naysayers. Throughout history, nature has demonstrated its built-in resiliency. But nature has also shown us its vulnerability to pollution, overfishing, coastal development, and unregulated tourism. The goal of the World Wildlife Fund is not to keep people out of nature or prevent communities from developing. The World Wildlife Fund is all about finding practical solutions for a healthy planet, a planet where people and nature can thrive together in a stable environment now and for generations to come. You know, every, everybody have a role to play, from the, from the kids in the school to the parent to the average person walking on the street to an organization to a to, uh, uh, private sector entity to a government entity, we can, we can all work together, try to work together in a very coordinated manner as possible to try and see how best we can um, conserve our resources, promote sustainable utilization of our resources so that Belize can make that stride towards um, reaching sustainable development. If we all come together in a very coordinated and integrated manner, sustainable development will be achievable. It will no longer be seen as something abstract, but something very tangible something you know that you can reach out and touch. For more information on the World Wildlife Fund programs in Belize, please contact our office in Belize City or visit our website at www.wwfca.org. 
WWF for a living planet.